Today's scripture lesson comes to us from the Gospel of John, the last chapter, chapter 21. The final words of the Gospel of John, verses 20 and 24. I invite you now to hear these often overlooked words of the Gospel of John. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, is it that? Who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. So the rumor spread in the community that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say that he would not die. But if it is my will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them. And we know that his, that his testimony is true. And this is the word of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. A lot of you have told me that the Gospel of John is your least favorite gospel in the Bible. You know, and I, I don't know how to compare. I, I think a lot of you maybe appreciate the Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel of Luke more. If those are your kind of action-packed summer blockbuster movies. They're quick-paced. There's a lot packed in them. And they don't linger on things. It's one story after another. It's action-packed. Lots of healings. Lots of cool things happening. These are the crowd pleasers. These are the ones that are going to earn a billion dollars at the box office. But the Gospel of John, not as many healings, not as many stories. The story is told a little bit slower. The Gospel of John appreciates all the little nuances of Jesus' teachings. Comparably, it's that, it's that movie that gets nominated for Oscars. Right? It's that Shape of Water. You know, it's that movie that's like, yeah, I didn't see that one, but uh, maybe I should. Then you, you never do. And so it's one of those stinkers, right? And the Gospel of John is one of those. And let me just say about the Gospel of John. It is, and I really truly mean this, it is the greatest piece of nonfiction I have ever read. I mean, and I'm not saying that because it's about Christ. I'm saying it because it is beautifully written. There is meaning behind every word. He hangs on to every word of Christ, and every word of Christ has at least three or four meanings. It's never at face value. But it also, the Gospel of John, reveals to us a lot about the man who wrote it. There are all these little clues, these little, little things, little nuances that, that reveal to us a little bit about the Gospel of John and the man who wrote it. For instance, there's this one little part in the Gospel of John. He, he doesn't refer to himself as John. He never says, I'm John. He never says, I'm a disciple. What he says, he describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. So for a lot of ministers who know these scriptures really well, when we hear that and we read that, we try to we, we keep a straight face, but inwardly, when we get to that part, we go, <laughs> like, seriously, you're going to call yourself that? It, it may be that he was just really appreciative, like he didn't feel worthy of Christ's love, and so he, he feels appreciative that God loves him. But let me tell you, it doesn't read that way. It's like if you went to the tomb. You were the one who discovered the tomb was empty on Easter morning. And then you come back and you tell me and you tell Taylor, right? And so I am retelling this story decades later. And I say, so-and-so went to the tomb. They saw that it was empty. And then they went to tell two people, Taylor and the guy whom Jesus loves. <laughs> how does that sound? It sounds like God loves me a little bit more than Taylor, right? That's how it sounds. And that's how it kind of comes off. So it's a little interesting sort of thing there that he's got going on. And then there's this other little detail from the resurrection story where, you know the story where you know, Mary goes back and tells the disciples, and then Peter and John, they run to the tomb, and for some reason he could not help himself. He had to say, we ran to the tomb, and I outran Peter. He was older than me. He worked out every day, and I still beat that sucker. I have Brits donuts every morning, and I am still faster than that guy. Like, why do you say that? It's just a little conceited, right? you got to brag about yourself. And then there's this other little interesting detail that tells us a little bit about John. 
is this little part that no one else includes. Everyone who saw the empty tomb said, he's risen, he's gone. But John had to go a little further. He said, he's risen, he's not there, he's resurrected. There's hope for the world. And his clothes were so neatly folded. The creases were folded at a perfect 90 degree angle. They were stacked on top of one another. And it's like, John, you are OCD, man. Like, what? Who notices that? Like, it's the greatest news in the world. You're like, the, the clothes were folded so well. It's this way of saying, hey, if you're OCD, this gospel's for you. I'm, I'm OCD as well. But then, there's this other little tidbit that I read just now. This other little insight into the man who writes the Gospel of John. And, and you get this little sense that the person who's writing the Scripture has great longevity, maybe more so than the other disciples. And as he's writing this, he's writing this cathartically. He's, he's declaring exactly why he got to live so long. You see, tradition says that John was the last living disciple. Of the other 11, he was the last one to survive. And not only did he survive, but he survived them by decades. And not just that, he died, tradition says, in his 90s, peacefully of natural causes, where the other 11 died in horrific ways. Like, in horrible ways. The gods are Peter. We all know how Peter died. Maybe you've heard that he was crucified upside down. Andrew was, was scourged and then crucified. James, his brother, was killed with a sword. Philip was scourged and crucified. Bartholomew was skinned alive and then beheaded. Thomas was speared to death. Matthew was literally stabbed in the back. Uh, James the Lesser was beaten and stoned. Uh, Thaddeus was crucified. And Simon the Zealot was crucified as well. And then there's John. And then there's John. John got to live to his 90s. He got to die of natural causes. May we all live into our 90s, but John somehow got to escape all of the martyrdom that no one else did. And so it's been suggested by scholars that perhaps John is suffering from a lot of guilt, a guilt that is similar to what a lot of veterans of war may experience. You know, a lot of, some veterans are where they come back home after being in battle, and they say to themselves, you know, how did my, my brother in arms die? And yet I'm here. How did he die? We were of the same. Uh, we, were, we were brothers, and, and we were in the same uh, group. And, and, and you know, it, it's so random how that happens, and yet I'm here and he's not. And so some scholars are suggesting that maybe he's dealing with a little guilt. Everyone else died but me. Why am I the last one to survive? Other people have suggested that that guilt was a projection onto him. That they were saying, you know, why didn't you die? Why didn't you die, John? Were you not faithful enough? Were you not bold enough in your faith? Why didn't you die? Why are you still here in your 90s? And you can hear this kind of cathartically playing out in the scriptures. John is answering that question through the words of Christ. And he's addressing his longevity on the beach. And if you could show that, that scene, this is where it takes place. We have that. There it is, yeah. And you know the story, right, where... Peter swims the shore on the Sea of Galilee, and Christ is there, and he cooks a little bit of breakfast, and they eat some fish, and, and God gives Peter grace for denying him three times. And then, you know, after that, you think the story is over, but there's these little few verses there. As Peter and Jesus are walking away, as they're walking away from the beach, and I imagine Christ having his arm over Peter's shoulder, you know, he says to Peter, look, you are forgiven. You have a purpose in life. I've got a plan for you. And you, Peter, are, you used to be in control of your life, but now I'm in control because you've got a purpose. And you're going to, you know, he alludes to it, you're going to be martyred one day. And Peter says, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with being martyred. I'm just glad that I have a purpose. I'll do anything for you. And so as they're walking away, Peter's got a whole new purpose in life. But then this interesting thing happens. He, he looks behind himself. And this, you know, guy is walking behind him, John, another disciple. And he begins to think to himself, wait a minute. He didn't say anything about martyrdom to this guy. He didn't say anything about death. And so Peter says, hey, what about this guy? What about old uh, son of thunder back here? What about Mr. Uh, going to be greatest in the kingdom back here? You know, he's not going to die. And then Peter, 
or Jesus rather, responds to him. And he didn't respond to him as tenderly and as gently as you would hope for. He was very sharp and very quick and very firm. And he said, hey, Peter, what is that to you? What is that to you? That's a whole separate thing that I got going over here with John. What is it to you, what I do with John, and what plan I have for him? Focus on me. You can hear Christ saying, focus on me and the path that I got for you. Both of you have extraordinary plans for your life. But don't go looking over your shoulder all the time. And we find out later through history that Peter and John, they both have extraordinary lives. Peter becomes the bedrock of the faith, the rock of the church. He begins the church after Pentecost. He preaches the greatest sermon ever told, and he, he, 3,000 people get saved, and he begins the church. And then John later in life, who had extraordinary writing skills, writes the Gospel of John and other things. But more importantly, he becomes the patriarch of the church the last living disciple, the one whose words guide us through the first century. They both have extraordinary roles. And John, in this gospel, is saying one is not better than the other. They're both incredible. But we've got to quit looking over our shoulder at what others are doing. And so imagine how different their legacy would be if they kept comparing themselves to each other. You know, weren't we in the same disciple class together? Didn't we graduate high school together yet? He's going to live a longer life and he's going to have a bigger house and a cushier life than me? How does that work, God? There's a, a quote from a, a 14th century mystic. It's a quote that I've heard for many years in my life and I've, I've heard it so often and I love it so much that I've almost adopted it as, as one of the principles of my faith. And she says this, she says that the soul does not grow by addition, but it grows by subtraction. The soul does not grow by addition, but it grows by subtraction. She's advocating not for you to downsize your home. She's not advocating for you to give away a lot of your stuff. She's not advocating for you necessarily to, to say no to more responsibilities. What she is saying is that you need to subtract anything that gets in the way of your relationship with Christ. This scripture that I read for you today, is about striving to please one person and to not satisfy the whole world. John is saying, your soul will be freer if you quit comparing yourself to others. Focus on God's plan for your life and don't get distracted. Quit looking over the shoulder. Quit thinking about who likes you and who doesn't. Quit thinking about who respects you and who doesn't. Quit thinking about who has the bigger home and the cushier life. And let that go and focus on God. Peter says these things. He looks over his shoulder, not because he's a jealous sinner, because he is insecure. Because he is insecure. Have you ever been insecure yourself? I have. And so he, he's an insecure person, and he begins thinking, wait a minute, if John, if Mr. Son of Thunder back here gets to live, does that mean that Christ loves me less? Does that mean I've screwed up more? Do I get a shorter life because I'm not good enough? What Peter's missing is that our security comes from God's love. It doesn't come from the fleeting whims of others. It doesn't come by whether or not someone loves us or respects us or, or if we're doing better than someone else. Our security comes from God. You may have heard this week. Facebook was in the news. Maybe you heard that. Not in a good way. But Facebook is news this week, and I know a lot of us are thinking about Facebook, and, and, uh, and you know, I, I've learned, you know, I was one of the first people on Facebook, and when I got on it, it was cool. Facebook is not cool anymore, let me just say. Uh, but, but when I got on it, it was cool. But through the years, I have learned something about myself and Facebook. Facebook is not a good thing to get on when you're feeling insecure. When you're having a really bad day and you're feeling bad about yourself, when you get on Facebook and you see all the great things that other people are doing, you're like, oh. What am I doing with my life? That's when you begin looking over your shoulder. Someone called Facebook the, the highlight reel for everyone. Very rarely does someone put their worst stuff on Facebook. Here's that really bad, ugly picture of me that I'm going to put on Facebook. Here's this really you know, you know, bad day that I have. Let me describe it for you. You know, the Atlanta Braves had a miserable season last year in baseball, a losing record. But I'm pretty sure you can find at least two minutes of highlights from that season. And it's the same thing with our lives. And many of us, it's a regular habit. 
of indulging our insecurities, of looking over our shoulders, comparing ourselves to one another. And when you do that, it makes your actions insecure as well. And it's not a good place to live in. You know, I gave in to this at one point in my life. Pastors, similar to the Apostle Peter, we oftentimes look over our shoulders, as many of us do. Uh, someone asked me this week, uh, when was a, a very challenging time in your faith? And I told them it was my second appointment, and I was being moved to, uh, to a little town called Mount Olive. Some of you have asked me, where is Mount Olive? Like, like, we don't know where that is. Like, some of you who maybe are transplants, and, and my response to you is this. You know that road called I-40 between Raleigh and Wilmington? Have you, have you know this road? You know that road, that part of the, the, that, that little part of the two-hour section that's kind of like the no-man's land? where it gets really flat, and there's nothing there, and it's really boring, and you're you know, chugging caffeine to stay awake. If you take one of those exits and you drive through Narnia, that's where Mount Olive is. Okay? Uh, Mount Olive is a place where the aesthetic everywhere is, is olive green, and everyone's obsessed with pickles, and, and even the university sign is green, and, and they even drop a pickle on New Year's Eve, and you're like, there are other things to eat in this world than pickles. But, but I, I went there, and I remember driving around my first day. I remember seeing, not, it's not necessarily what I saw, but what I didn't see. You know, I, I didn't see all of the restaurants that I enjoyed. You ever heard of that place called Outback Steakhouse? They, they, they have the perfect mix of butter and seasoning on their steaks. I mean, it's just it's perfect. And I remember thinking, where is the Outback here? Where is the Outback in Mount Olive? And there was no Ch Chipotle in Mount Olive. The closest one was an hour away. I had to drive here to Wilmington or to Raleigh to go to a Chipotle. I mean, come on. I mean, this is where I spent three years, no Chipotle. And as I was thinking through, like Peter, I started looking over my shoulder at my colleagues and those I graduated with, and they're ministering in places with, in big cities. One person is a mile away from an Outback Steakhouse, and I'm thinking, God, what did I do? What did I do? You know, I, I, mean, I got a Walmart, and that's it, man. I, that's, that's what I got. And, 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 and that looking over the shoulder, it really defines a lot of your actions, that, that kind of insecurity. And then, you know, you dig into the scriptures, and it, it took a while, but Christ very gently said to me, what is it to you what I'm doing with other people around you? I've got a plan for your life. I've got an extraordinary plan for your life. It's going to unfold, but focus on me. Focus on me and trust me that this plan is going to be okay. And so once God said it to me, my soul began to feel free. I began to love more free. I began to work more free. And, I, and like Peter, I, I, I began to live into the life that God had for me. Yeah, I was reminded this week that, that, you know, it's hard to tell what is from God and what's not from God, what's God's will and what's not God's will. Yet sometimes bad things happen and it wasn't God's plan. It's just the fact that we live in a chaotic world. And then sometimes things happen and God was the one who led you through it. And you say, God, I can't make sense of this. You know, there are some things in life that they just don't have any silver linings. But they're so bad that you just you can't find anything positive to say. Even the most positive person, I try to be a positive person, even the most positive person says, I can't find anything good about this. I think about the, the Hebrews who were enslaved in Egypt. They were in slavery and have been for generations. And there is no silver lining to slavery. You can't say, well, it's tough that we're enslaved, but there we also have, well, we don't have anything else. But yet the faith of those Hebrews, they still prayed. And their prayer was nothing but a groan, but they still prayed. And so while there are situations on earth where there are, is no silver lining, there has never been a situation or a challenge where we didn't have the hope of God. We always have the hope of our Lord. And God says to us, look, if you just trust in me and trust for my plan for you, it will be okay. But focus, focus. Today's passage is is asking all of us, it's begging all of us, and it's saying to us, where do we find our security? Do we find our validation in others' love and respect for us? Because let me tell you, that ebb and flows, that's like a roller coaster ride. That won't satisfy you. Or do we find our security in God's love, in God's plan for our life? Do we get that security from other places? If so, then maybe we need to do a little subtraction, right? Perhaps God is saying to you today, look at me. 
Focus. Focus. What is it to you what they're doing? Focus on me because I have an extraordinary plan for your life. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for the mistakes, for the insecurities of these disciples who, in doing so, teach us about ourselves and the ways that we often look over our own shoulders. So, Lord, help us to keep our eyes to you, to keep our focus on you and to trust, Lord, that you do have great things in store for us, God. Help us to quit the practice of looking over our shoulders. Help us to let go of our insecurities. And help us to be firm in our faith in you. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose in confidence we have today. Amen. <coughs>